My name is Victor Reveles. I am 24 years old. I am a DACA recipient. And all of the benefits that I have received from the Deferred Action Childhood Arrival Law are in danger of being terminated. I'm Edwin Ortiz Lopez. I'm 24 years old. I'm a Dreamer and a DACA student. And all my DACA benefits are in danger to be terminated. I was born in Aguascalientes, Mexico. Um, I came here at the age of three years old. I don't recall much of Mexico. Uh, it's, you know, basically I've lived here my, my whole life. Um, growing up, it didn't really bother me or I didn't see any conflict in being undocumented. Because as a kid, uh, you're, th you're thinking about playing, just going to school and interacting with your peers. So it's not something you really think about. Um, however, there were, um, how do I put this, situations in life that were prepping me to fully understand what it is like to be an unlawful citizen, you know, uh, an illegal in the United States. Um, how I came to, you guys are probably asking, how did I come to the U.S.? The way I arrived here, I actually, um, I used someone else's identification card and they passed me through as, you know, their child. And eventually my mom came in. I, I must imagine like the turmoil that was going through my mom's mind in letting their three-year-old son go with someone else. But it's a risk that she was willing to take for, you know, a better life, you know, for myself and to develop, you know, to be someone successful in, in the future. We intend to do the right thing by these children. Their parents need to know that this is an incredibly dangerous situation and it is unlikely that their children will be able to stay. Uh, I was born in Mexico, uh, state of Michoacán, Morelia. On March 14, 1993, uh, we moved to León, Guanajuato when I was about six years old, uh, given the circumstances that my dad owned a house in León, Guanajuato. So uh, we're kind of like a middle class uh, people living in León, Guanajuato. But then the reason why I came here in 2003, if I recall correctly, it's because my mom was physically abused by my dad. It was a dom dom domestic violence relationship. I would witness that when I was a little kid. Uh, I would witness how my dad would hit my mom for no apparent reason. And that was the reason why we came to this country. Uh, it all started as a joke. My, my mom told me when I was 10 years old, nine or 10, give or take, that we were gonna move, we were gonna go to the US. So at that point, I didn't know why, I didn't realize why we were gonna go to the US. So all of a sudden, it happened, uh, like fast. We were, the next week we were here in the US. When I got here, it was a different, it was kind of like a culture shock. It was, it was different. I remember I crossed illegally, of course, through the border, pretty much the border with the Coyotes uh, son's legal papers. So I was I was ten and I looked like his son. So they used his son's papers for me to cross uh, to the U.S. So and I still remember that day as if it was yesterday. My mom came along with me. They dropped me off at the Coyotes house of the person who was charged to bring us to the U.S. They dropped me off at their house. Uh, and and it, it was during the afternoon. I remember just seeing my mom go uh, leave along with other people in the car. Uh, they dropped me off. I was crying. I was crying. I was, it was really traumatizing. And what I remember is sitting on the stairway, on the stairs. It was a two-story house, of course. Sitting on the stairs, them eating as a family. It was three kids uh, and, and the parents. And what I remember, it's 
the mom telling me, because she's I was crying, I was crying to death. Uh, I don't know what's going on. She told me, if you keep crying, you're never gonna see your mom again. So of course, that made me cry even more. Uh, I didn't stop crying. But long story short, that same day, I was already in the US. I've had both uh, um, Victor Rivelas and uh, Edwin Ortiz Lopez uh, in, in several classes each, sometimes at the same time, sometimes separately. Um, I've always come to expect them to be in the top 5% of the class. That's what I see out of them all the time. So I had several classes with them. I know what to expect from them. So, and I expect them to stay after class ask, asking extra questions. I'm stopping by my office hours, so I've been very pleased with them as students. I think that they do very well. Um, I've been they're, they're some of, some of my favorite students to interact with because they're because I like the extra questions, the extra stuff we do. They go go in the extra mile, um, and so I, I always I always see that from them. Both Victor and Edwin are on a cross country team, and so they tell me a little bit about that. But as far as I can, it doesn't really impact in any of the classes I've been in. I mean, occasionally they'll have to miss class for a meet or something, but apart from that, it, it doesn't really have any serious impact on classes. They're, um, like I said, they're still able to stay on top of everything just fine. And so as far as I can tell, they, they're managing that just fine. Um, obviously I'm not the coach, so I don't, I don't see that part of what's going on with their lives, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen anything that would lead me to believe they're not balancing anything well. I, I, I see that what seems to be uh, um, fairly good time management. They seem to be staying on top of things fairly well. Um, so I'm not not concerned about them in, in, at all in that kind of way. So um, I know that uh, they are, they've shown me to be, proven themselves to me to be responsible uh, students. So I come to trust that they will continue to do that. So growing up, uh, we were poor, we weren't the wealthiest people. Uh, we were living like in a room, you know, with other, uh, other individuals. So I could, I could honestly say I've never had a, a real home that I could call my own, besides here now, you know, which is my place and I'm paying for it. Um, the instance where I realized, that's one of the instances where I realized the disadvantage we had as being illegals here in the US. Um, the other disadvantage that I would see is that as a kid, since my mom wasn't a US citizen, she had no means of having an official job. Thus, we had to work under the table um, to get cash, you know, to survive. That's what we came for, to strive. So, um, we started selling tamales on the street. You know, for those that don't know, uh, we used to go around in, in the city, and in a, in a little shopping cart, and sell tamales all over the city. And I think I started selling with her when I was in first grade. So I've always been working since I was in first grade. Um, and I, you know, at that point in time as a kid, I was gladly helping my mom because I felt like I was supporting, we were supporting each other, you know? Uh, at the time I also had my stepdad, but he worked as a gardener. But you know, we also, it was a, a family environment where we worked, even though it was an abusive family, given my stepdad's, you know, reinforcements, but that's not the issue right now. Um, all I understand is that we've always been hard workers. And that's something that's always been engraved in me growing up as a child. Sadly, my stepdad was deported, which I am sad to say, but I'm grateful for, because of the abusive relationship. I do not wish deportation on any human being, but at that point in time, it was essential for us to kind of get away from this family dynamics, you know, all these stressors. Um, at that point in time, I was in eighth grade, and I had to take the role as the man of the household. So I had to start working and provide shelter for my family since I was in eighth grade. So I've never had the full chance to have the typical teenage life, I think I understood my role, the struggle of what it is to be, you know, a Mexican in the United States. It was 
it was tough at first because I we lived with my older sister. Uh, she already had a family, her kids, you know, her husband, and and we moved. We moved several times along the process. We moved to Gainesville. I lived in Georgia, Gainesville for like two years, then went back to California, uh, and I lived there since. 05, since 2005. Uh, I went to school there, uh, sixth grade, all the way to, to, to high school, my JUCO, junior college. Uh, and growing up has, has a, as a, a Mexican in a way in, in, in the United States, uh, living in California. It was tough at times, but at the same time, it wasn't because our community was just a lot of Latinos, a lot of Hispanics. So uh, we all brought our culture with us, our beliefs. It's not like we left everything behind. We did it. I mean, other than our family, you know, I have family in Mexico who I haven't seen in 14 years. I haven't seen my dad in 14 years. Uh, but I believe everything that happens happens for a reason. And I, what happened has shaped me in a way that in a person that I am today I see uh, I don't want to end up like my older brothers in a job getting paid minimum wage or in a job they don't like or in a job they don't they, they don't enjoy uh, that that has always been my goal I want to attend school uh, follow uh, something I really like and enjoy such as psychology Spanish or sociology but going back to, to my teen years, I guess when I was 10, middle school, elementary, it was hard at first because, first because I didn't know the language. So sometimes there were students that would make fun of me because I didn't really know how to say things. So, uh, but did not, it didn't affect me, which is good, it didn't affect me. So, but at the same time, it took me a while to learn the language because at home, it's always, it, it has always been Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. At school, middle school, and elementary, it was always, uh, most of the time, well, yeah, English, of course, but I had friends who were Latinos who would always speak Spanish. So, and it wasn't until, I was in an LS, uh, ESL, sorry, ESL class in eighth grade. And for us, that was like a, a class where they, teach us English pretty much and then as soon as I got freshman year I started to talk and speak more English so it took me I believe it took me like quite a few years to actually speak it fluently and understand it fluently. I'm a hard believer that things happen for a reason and I guess that had to happen for me to realize that okay you know yeah I'm an immigrant I'm a DACA student I'm an E540 student I'm a dreamer and and uh in a country which uh, I don't, I wasn't born here. So, and, but I believe that I've lived here for most than half of my life. Uh, I was reading this article and it said that 50% of those 800,000 DACA recipients who who, who 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 have the DACA now, 50% of the 50 half of them came when before they were six years old. So they, with that being said, most of them have lived here for more than half of their lives. And, and now for the president, current president to just uh, quit or cancel the DACA, it's, 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 it's hard for us. And I was, that same article that I was reading, it's within, a, uh, within 10 years, the economy is gonna lose $400 billion uh, because of and 91% of us who, who are, are actually employed and you know, employed through the taxes, we regenerate business. 51% also uh, own a business. They, 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 they own a business now. So just imagine how much money the economy, the US is gonna lose within a gap of 10 years. But, um, so now, okay, going back to, to, to how it all started. Then I, I went to JUCO in, in, in California, from Santa Ana, California, Orange County. Uh, I grew up there. I, that's my town, it's my, it's my home. I feel like it's my Mexico and my US together. Uh, uh, some people call me American because I, I, 
I speak English, or especially here in the Midwest, I've had people calling me like, oh, like American. I'm like, no, I'm, I don't really, I'm Mexican, of course, but I, I like when people call me Californian or Californian because that's where, that, that's where I grew up, that's where I belong, uh, that's where my family is, that's where it all started. Uh, so then I applied to the DACA, which is Deferred Action for Child or Arrivals, uh, and I believe it was 2012. These are young people who study in our schools, they play in our neighborhoods, they're friends with our kids, they pledge allegiance to our flag. They are Americans in their heart, in their minds, in every single way but one, on paper. They were brought to this country by their parents, uh, sometimes even as infants, and often have no idea that they're undocumented. Put yourself in their shoes. Imagine you've done everything right your entire life, studied hard, worked hard, maybe even graduated at the top of your class, only to suddenly face the threat of deportation to a country that you know nothing about, with a language that you may not even speak. That's what gave rise to the DREAM Act. It says that if your parents brought you here as a child, you've been here for five years, and you're willing to go to college or serve in our military, you can one day earn your citizenship. It makes no sense to expel talented young people who, for all intents and purposes, are Americans. They've been raised as Americans, understand themselves to be part of this country. You know, it was senior year, and that was a point in time where, you know, I was a 3.8 GPA student. You know, all the teachers always encouraged me, you're going to go to a good school, you're on the right path. However, at that point in time, it was like taboo to talk about being an immigrant and what's the next step in college. There was no resources. No one helped me to like, okay, you could, this is the next plan, because there wasn't any. There wasn't any. So I applied. I applied and I got accepted. But I couldn't go because money. Money talks. Money makes things move sometimes. It's sad to say. But being an illegal immigrant at that point in time, back in 2011, before the DACA, um, I didn't have I didn't have the you know I didn't have the privilege to go to a, a big university. At that point in time, I realized um, the internal turmoil that I had. Here's the thing that nobody talks about, and I know I'm not the only individual that feels this way. When you are placed in a situation where you have been raised here since you were three years old, you identify with the U.S. being your home. But when there's so many environmental factors and news, the media telling you, know, go home, even people's comments, that you're not wanted here, you start to conflict your identity. Your identity starts to really like, to be questioned. Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. If I go back to Mexico, I don't, I don't know what's there. I understand the language, but I don't know the dynamics. I don't know the life, okay? Uh, I'm in the US, I feel like I, I, I belong here, but I'm not wanted here. At that point in time, it's sad to say, I wasn't proud to be Mexican. I wasn't proud just because of all the negativity that I kept on getting, all the disadvantages, how could you be proud of something that keeps bringing you down, you know? And it, it might step on people's toes for me saying this, but I know I'm not the only individual that feels this way, you know? So, with that being said, this is how it ties down to my sport. I had this crazy idea back into, when the 20 Olympics, to 2012 Olympics came out, you know, that was right before the DACA. I had this crazy idea that if I became this great runner, I had no talent, that maybe a school would find me and take me for athletics. And I don't know, I, I, it was a long shot, but I was like, I'm willing to try. Look at this, it's so absurd to think that I was gonna make the Olympics. You know, I was a kid, 
no talent, you know. But I have this, this, this drive, this will to be something, to be something better, you know. Um, and so that's how I started running. And that's why I gave him my all. I wake up every day at four in the morning to go run because I used to have work from five in the morning till six, at, six in the afternoon. It was 11 hour shifts and we wouldn't get paid less than a minimum, minimum wage. I used to work at a flea market and we used to get paid only $50 for those whole hours. That's slavery. But you know what? I had to keep my mouth shut because that's the only job that I could take as, a, as an immigrant. Uh, those, those years, there was a lot of conflict and a lot of identity crisis, which I know a lot of people, even now, there are some individuals who do not meet the requirements for the DACA. And uh, given, let's say, some of them missed it by one year, and they are facing now what I faced then, which is something I can um, empathize with and reflect on. Is this is the right thing to do for the American people. Bay Bika, I, I, didn't, I didn't ask for an argument. I'm answering your question. It is the right thing to do for the American people, and here's why. Here's the reason. Because these young people are going to make extraordinary contributions and are already making contributions to our society. I've got a young person who is serving in our military, protecting us and our freedom. The notion that, that in some ways we would treat them as expendable makes no sense. Uh, the first time I heard about the DACA, it was I think in 2012 when, when it got approved by President Obama and the Congress. And I believe I, I don't recall how I heard it, but I think it was in the news. A new beginning for some undocumented youth who have applied and qualified for the hotly debated Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals policy of President Obama, which was enacted on August 15. The Department of Homeland Security says that a small group of applications has been approved and those immigrants are being notified this week about the decision. And within that same month that it got approved, I, I, I applied myself. I didn't have to go to a lawyer to help me. Uh, I just read the instructions online. I already knew I had to read. I took probably like a good two days, three days to read all the instructions to make sure everything's correct. Uh, and you have to show proof that you've been here before you were a certain age, I believe it was 15, uh, before, t before uh, that you got here before 2012. So I had all that, my transcripts, my report cards since elementary, since middle school, and my mom uh, took really good care of them. So she kept them in a, in a place where I could have access to. Uh, and I did all that myself, I applied, since I've been in sports, I pretty much sent transcripts. I sent uh, where it shows that I was in hospital. I sent like my certificates that I participated in the sport all four years of high school. Uh, I sent all those documents and along with the applications. Uh, and uh, the process probably took like two months. I sent it and within two weeks I received the letter that they have received it. And they were in the process uh, and then another, I believe it was another two, 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 two weeks and a half, uh, they sent me another letter saying that I have to go to this certain place, USCIS um, office to do the biometrics, to do all the testing. Uh, so, and after that, I believe it, I received my social security number, which I didn't have one before. Uh, my EAD card, which is the working permit, and my social in the mail within two weeks uh, post that. So uh, the process it took like two months. I didn't have to, a month and a half. I didn't really have to wait that long because again, uh, I've been in school. I have all the proof that I was, I was here, that I'm a, a good citizen in a way, or I'm a good student. So. Um, and as soon as I received the the working permit, I pretty much applied for jobs. Like again, uh, the difference before not having the working permit or the the, the social security number is the difference. I believe was the job. 
I would do side jobs like you know, cutting neighbors' grass or you know, doing their mowing their lawns or or, or working at a farm just selling food. Uh, they would pay me with cash, of course. But after that, I, I applied for the Goodwill company. And then after that, I worked for the Oakley. Then I worked for this Reacher's company. Then then uh, I worked at school, which really I made a lot of connections. My JUCO as a mentor, uh, helping students, telling them about our programs at the school, telling them how, uh, all the resources we have, informing them because there was a lot of students who were DACA students as well. So informing them about the process and and telling them if they haven't applied, if they qualify or not. So the job made was, was the main, um, the biggest difference of having the, the social security number in the card or, of, or not having it. When the DACA came out, um, it was like the golden ticket. I didn't. At first when I heard about it, I heard it from actually some of the owners at the flea market and uh, and I didn't, I didn't think it was real. I just thought it was it's one of those flukes, you know, people have talked about it all the time. Until I, I did my research and, it's, and this, we have this opportunity now to, you know, develop, to develop as, you know, um, you know, as someone who was pursuing an education. You know, finally get a decent job to help your family and also become this great individual. Um, I still remember why I was driven to pursue an education. And it was because one day when I was working at the flea market, I was reading a book and someone came up to me. Uh, someone of fair skin. And they spoke to me and I you know, responded in English and um, they were perplexed at the idea that I spoke English, that they're like, oh, you, you, you speak English? So that was like, I, they had this idea that just because I have these Hispanic features that I'm not educated or that I understand the language. And at that point in time, I decided if someone judged me based on my appearance, I wanted to show others that it's not just about the appearance, but we as Hispanics have the ability to prove people wrong to show them that we can make a change here in the U.S., that we're not just here to be lazy or any of that. So thanks to the DACA, you know, in 2012, at that point in time, I decided to give it my all and to pursue an education and to be the best that I could be. So the process with the DACA, um, here's the thing. The fee is $475. Some of us who aren't, you know, poor like myself, yeah, that was a, a large amount of money. And here's the thing, many people like myself were scared to submit the application because it was this idea that if you turn it in once and if you don't do it right, you were revoked. And there's no turning back. And your idea and your chances of getting this privilege is gone. You know, so that was a scary part besides the money. <laughs> you know, $475. Um, so I noticed a lot of people would pay lawyers, you know, to get their people with them. And some of them were charged up to $900, $1,000, and that's just something that I couldn't afford, you know? Well, you know, in California, the rent is like, literally, that's your rent, $900. Who has that kind of money, you know? Well, I didn't at the time. So, with my process, what I decided I had to be a risk taker, you know, that gave me 100 dreamer. Take a risk. Well, that's you where it takes you. I did the application by myself, and I worked for the four hundred seventy-five dollars. I submitted it. Um, the process took a month for them to give me feed. No, two weeks for them to give me the feedback that they had accepted the, the application. Um, it, it was a month to say they're officially looking over the whole transaction and that it's pending, but you are still. We will be informed. Uh, it took me three months to officially get everything done. Currently, I my DACA expires next November of 2018. By then, I will accomplish you know one of my um, you know aspirations, goals, which is getting a bachelor's. 
you know, and we'll take it from there. I want to get my PhD, but everything in due time and take it as it is, you know. And now with this whole news that, you know, it's, we could be possible, you know, that the DACA program could possibly be canceled. Uh, yeah, it's a little unsettling. And, you know, you start to think about, oh, my hard work is going to go down the drain. But no, it's like we've been doing this this whole time, even without the DACA. We've always, well, I've always understood that if things get tough, keep going. Don't give up. This morning, faced with the very real possibility of a potential immediate shutdown of the entire DACA program by a federal court, President Trump took the responsible and constitutional step of announcing that the administration will be phasing out the program over the next two years. Well, Attorney General Jeff Sessions is expected to announce the end of a program protecting nearly 800,000 immigrants brought to the United States legally as children. CBS News confirms that President Trump plans to let the program known as DACA end. The Obama administration started DACA five years ago. It allows young immigrants to obtain work permits and avoid deportation. News that the president is seriously considering ending a program that provides legal status to hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants who came to the United States as children. The move the president is considering would put nearly 800,000 undocumented immigrants in danger of being deported. They are known as dreamers, people who it came... It could be the end of the dream for many young illegal immigrants. President Trump is expected to fulfill a campaign promise as soon as tomorrow by announcing the end of the so-called dreamer program. When DACA was first announced, I, in the back of my mind, realized that it was a ticking time bomb. At least that's how I saw it that it would eventually be, you know, canceled. So that's why during these years, these blessed four years that I've had, I've, you know, given my best. Like, even if I get a B on a test, that's like, whoa, like, you didn't give it your all. Like, I want to give it my all. Like, sometimes my friends will ask, well, do you want to go out? And I say no. And I feel like they don't understand that I have these, I have this, like, these people behind me who I want to guide. I would love to party, I want to go out. I do go out sometimes. I'm not saying I'm a hermit crab. But, you know, I want to show that I gave it my all and it's reflective in all my work, whether that's a competition and running, whether that's academics. I just want to show that no matter the adversity, you can make it. And let's say, hypothetically, if it were to be canceled, um, it, it's, it should be, it should, will sure be a big blow for many of us. I'm not saying it isn't. But the idea behind it is that some of us took the DACA for granted and now they are worried about it. So this situation should remind people, to bring people of why we got the DACA, of why we need to use it. Some people are now concerned when they did nothing during these years. The individuals who did something with that time frame, they understand the virtue, all the great things that come from it. And I feel like right now, if it were to be canceled, um, people need to understand to not give up and that hard work is there all the time, whether you want it or not. Um, if you truly, um, what I've learned from all this, if you truly keep going with your aspirations and your goals, you will get somewhere. You will. Education is something that nobody can take away from you. That's the thing. That's the main thing people need to remember. them I, I knew their coaches for a while um, I knew uh, Edwin's coach for almost over 10 years in there and then um, the coach kind of contacted me and said hey we'd be interested in it and after talking uh, with Edwin I was like yes because he was a great kid over the phone and I met him also in person when I was there Victor I did not get to meet in person but just knowing his coach and after speaking with Victor and um, just love this character. I know it was just over the phone, but it was great. I think athletically they made a big change, but what I'm excited about is the change that they made in the impact that they made on the team as leaders. Uh, they both have four old, they're both four old students, so they're very, very um, academic driven. Um, but yeah, it's great to see them grow. 
Um, both of them were below average junior college runners, and they came here and they're able to make the nationals, uh, not just in cross country, but as individuals for our outdoor national track. I think the biggest change I want to say is probably that they become great leaders um, and great mentors um, on and off the cam um, the team. I believe I've made a lot of accomplishments in school. Of course, I graduated from high school with a 3.4 GPA, I believe. Uh, then my JUCO with a 3.7. Then uh, now here it went up. So, but running has given me this new type of opportunities in which okay I got to travel I got to compete at a high level or, uh, I got I got to finish in the with the top runners of like uh, hundreds not hundreds but like 200 300 runners uh, and that's when I realized that okay I could actually do something with this uh, I kept working hard first year Juco 2003 it went well season made it a state finals, uh, then track. Then I took a year off because of family problems. I took a year off. I was only a part-time student at that time. I did not run at all uh, competitively um, back. And then I, I decided that, that running, that I really need to compete and to race in order for me to feel happy and satisfied. It's weird because it's part of me. Running it's part of me. It's it's like it's like my drug in a way, which my ecstasy it makes me feel happy. It makes me feel different. It makes me feel like I belong somewhere. So I joined back the team. I went back to the team, talked to the coach, I joined again. Then then I received a call from the coach Dominguez here at Mogao that he wanted me to run for this school. So I was thinking about it, uh, it took me uh, probably like a month to decide whether I wanted to come here or not. So I talked to my counselor, who's a really friend of mine, who's also a runner, back at my JUCO. Uh, I talked to my professors at my JUCO. Uh, I remember my counselor told me, hey, um, I told him like, okay, I have to live on campus, this and this and that. He told me, hey, you should go because education is an investment. It's like investing in a car. Would you rather invest in your education or would you rather invest in a car? So I decided to come here because of, to get a to get an education. And and now when cross country last year, uh, thanks to the to the coaching, thanks to the all the hard work we did as a team, we finished uh, we finished first in our conference. First in our conference, we made it to nationals. I got fifth place in the conference overall. Uh, and at nationals, we finished 11th place uh, in the whole, uh, at nationals. And that was a really a big, big accomplishment. Uh, I got better. Uh, uh, then for track, outdoor track, uh, me and my other teammate made it to the marathon to compete at Gulf Shores, Alabama. Uh, first, we had to do the half marathon in December to qualify for the marathon in May. And at that point, when I ran the half marathon and I realized that I was okay, I, I did really well. I realized like, oh, shoot, you know, like the training, it's, it's I'm getting better. I'm, 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 uh, it, I've never imagined me coming from a, a city or a town in Mexico, living in California, Georgia, ending up here, going to Illinois, going to Kansas, going to Iowa, going to going to Alabama to compete. It's it's really like oh wow, you know, it's all these all these things I've been through, and it has been worth it for me to be here where I'm at right now.
first time I met Victor and Edwin, they, of course, they were all speaking Spanish, and I didn't really know that much Spanish, and we were all kind of like, well, that's kind of cool, but kind of weird, because I don't know what they're saying. Um, but as we got to know them, they were, they were so nice, and they were so accepting of everyone, and they were hilarious. Uh, they work, ever since the first day, they've worked really, really hard. Um, like, on the course, they give their 100% best, and in practice, they may joke off sometimes, but they know when to get serious, and um, even in academics, Victor will stay up so late doing homework, and Edwin as well, and they would work, and um, that's something that has stayed constant no matter how long I've known them, is they've always worked their hardest. Um, of course, we've gotten more comfortable with each other over the over like the months and the year I've known them, <laughs> but they've always been as accepting as as ever. We hang out a lot. Um, we Victor introduced me to dancing, um, but not like weird like white people dancing like his like bachata reggaeton, and it was so fun and I had never done that before and. He was so nice to just like, the first time we were out together, he invited me to dance and I had never done it before. And he was super nice and taught me how to do it and I love it now. Um, and Edwin is so funny. He loves his music when we're just hanging out and they both give really, really good advice. And I love hanging out with them. Um, I wish I could do it more actually. Um, in the classroom, uh, they pay attention really well, like probably more than I do. Uh, and they are so devoted to their studies and they love what they do. And that's something that is kind of rare sometimes in college students. Um, they are just like obsessed with their subject and I don't think they could work any harder <laughs> at school. <laughs> Victor and Edwin are two different types of individuals, um, but they both work hard. Um, I've seen a lot of improvement since when they first got here. I think uh, the first thing we did for uh, like, uh, practice or before practice, before we even started practicing, was a time trial to see where we were at. And um, last year, um, the the improvement has been amazing. I, I remember um, we came from running really slow times to um, just competing at a national level. And uh, just seeing their uh, hard work paying off and, and their, de their determination to, um, I guess, succeed, not only in, in, in running, but in school as well, academics. Is, uh, pretty nice. <laughs> we do hang out a lot, so um, but they also know when when it's time for um, when to put school as a priority. So um, when they want to put school as a priority, they'll just let us know. You know, we can't. I can't go out tonight, or you know. Um, but as individuals, they're very responsible. They're hardworking. I don't regret coming here. I don't, I don't regret it at all. Yes, I left my family and friends in California uh, temporarily for two years or a year and a half. But I don't regret coming here and running gave me that tool uh, to keep following my dreams, uh, such as getting education, first of all. Uh, and uh, I came here last August of 2016, last year, uh, of my major psychology, minor in sociology. Uh, I believe I, I work hard, so uh, nothing was given to me. I've worked since I was 18 uh, to pay for my college textbooks, to pay for my transportation, to get my first car, uh, to pay for my cell phone, so and I knew because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to ask my dad. I don't, 
at this, at this point, I don't really, really talk to my dad as much, so I don't really ask him for any help. I've, I believe I've accomplished a lot of things through life, thanks to, to the DACA, thanks to uh, the support from my family, friends, uh, and then knowing that it's it's gonna it's pretty much started canceled, but we still people so there's other DACA students who still have the, their status. Um, but I believe it, it. Yeah, I mean mentally, psychologically, it's it's getting to us. But I feel like, as many others, that we're not afraid. Uh, we won't stop trying. We worked so hard to be here for us just to give up like that. So um, it, it's not, it, it's, it will affect us eventually, but but it's not the end. You know, it's, 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 we're gonna keep working hard. We're gonna keep going to school. We're gonna keep reaching our goals. Um, I believe that we're the future of this, this country and we have held so much in this economy that, that it just, doesn't make sense for, for this president to just get rid of it that easily. Um, it just means that it's an end of a phase, but it's it's start of a new one in which we're going to keep trying, we're going to keep fighting. Uh, we've done so much uh, just for them to just get rid of it. And that doesn't mean the end of my goals, doesn't mean the end of my aspiration or my dreams. It just means that now we're stronger, we feel stronger than ever to, to keep reaching our goals and keep reaching our dreams. It just means that I feel stronger to graduate from college, from the university, uh, get my, my BA, hopefully my master's and bachelor's, that's the goal. And not show people that we're not criminals or we're not rapists because that does not affect us. That does not affect us at all. Um, yeah, they can say that. At the end of the day, the statistically research shows the opposite. So, but unfortunately, there's people in this country who actually believe that and who actually think that we shouldn't be here. Then what's the whole point of you know, the best nation in the world if we can't really do what we deserve to do with this life? What's the whole point of coming to this country, which is pretty much, there's, there's a lot of diversity in this country. And for people who actually weren't here first, that was the Native Americans, uh, tell us that, okay, you can't be here. You have to go back to your country. It's it's it's, it's nonsense. It's just it just makes me laugh how ignorant sometimes people can be. Um, but again, I don't really pay attention to that. I just pay attention. I just focus on my dreams and my aspirations and what I want to reach. And uh, um, school and sports, of course. So I think I'm speaking from a lot of students who are in the same situation as me that we're not gonna give up, we're gonna keep going to school, we're not gonna drop out, we're not gonna quit, we're not gonna just go back to our house and lock the door from our room and start crying. No, we're not gonna do that. So it's just that, like I said before, it's just an end of a phase. And we're, gonna, we're gonna keep working. Um, we're gonna try our best to, to, for the government or for the president, for the Congress, I just said, to do something about it. I can't really speak for anybody particularly, but I do enjoy uh, all these DACA people we have in the United States. I feel like they represent what America stands for well, uh, the American dream even though they have to renew it every two years, uh, them having the opportunity to do this in the United States is a great thing. Well, I have a cousin that is a DACA holder, and uh, he came to the United States at a very young age. Um, my problem is that everyone says, well, they need to go about 
getting their citizenship the legal way well you tell me the legal way because there isn't a way and the DACA deferment is the only thing keeping these people here and my cousin came here at a really young age and all he knows is America he doesn't even speak Spanish um, he this is the only way he can get an education and to return back to a place where your prospects of having a successful life are really low is almost criminal in my opinion. I mean, they've worked hard and they've been here since a very young age so even if they were to go back or, or if they didn't get the funding I know they'd find a way to succeed some way or another um, but that's them as individuals other people I really can't speak for them but them as individuals I know they would be all right they, they would work hard so I don't think it's a really good idea to uh, get rid of DACA because of the people that come here at a young age and have always been doing things right, like paying taxes and going to school. I don't think it's right for them to just be kicked out of the country and not be able to work. I understand that he's, he, what Trump is trying to do is, you know, he's going based on just like, he thinks he just thinks it's illegal, which it is. I know, I know people should get the green card, make it legal wise but I feel like if you were like for them to if you were already here at a young age and you grow up you came here you're, you're you don't have any criminal records you work you work you go to school you do a sport again no criminal records you pay taxes I, I think it's not fair um, I would would be the one who would have to say that I would support DACA not being removed because my friends that are currently using that program, it really helps them keep a job here in the United States and I'd hate to see that go. Uh, um, I definitely think cutting the entire program was not um, the best choice, <laughs> especially when I see people like Edwin and Victor who work so hard, they do everything right. Um, they have done everything right in the past to be where they are now, and um, I just don't think cutting the entire program was a really good idea. Um, and it, to think that they would have to go all the way back to where they came from uh, and start from nothing uh, just does not make any sense to me. Um, I think the DACA program was a strength of the U.S., and I think that if Edward and Victor did have to go, that I would be affected because I wouldn't get to spend time with them, uh, I wouldn't know them, and they probably wouldn't have a good way of communicating with me. So I think that it will affect more people than Trump thinks it will. I personally think that it's a shame um, uh, that they're taken away from students like that. I, I understand where the government is coming, but I think I have more of a a reality check in the sense that I see them every day and how hard they work. Um, I can only speak for Edwin and Victor, um, and they're they're great, great residents of our country. They do great things. They just don't go to school. They work 30 hours a week. They run every morning. They represent our university great, um, and they're great mentors. Um, and that's how I feel. I feel. Um, knowing, and I can only speak for uh, students that I know, like Edwin and Victor, um, I think they deserve an opportunity um, to be able to grow. I know our university's done a great job of helping them with any type of resource they need, and I'm just glad that um, I work here and they're able to work at a university that is culturally, culturally um, diverse and very sensitive to helping our students first.